Uh, I want to thank you, David, for all that nice introduction and all those uh, undeserved uh, uh, compliments. But you had one fact wrong, and I really have to clarify. I left Washington in 1985 not because of virtue, but because I was run out of town on a rail. So uh, that was uh, why uh, you know I never came back, really. Um, I am very happy to be here because some of you may have noticed uh, that in the last uh, few days, I have been enormously politically incorrect. And uh, I had a, uh, like a summary, a condensation of my book uh, in the New York Times Sunday, and it elicited a firestorm of denunciation. Um, and um, the reason I know that is that uh, Professor Paul Krugman told me so. Um, and he told me that I was a cranky old man uh, because I believed in such things as I'm going to talk about today as sound money, fiscal rectitude, and free markets. But, you know, the interesting thing about this is that if you're writing a book on these kinds of serious matters, you might even want to arrange, next time you do a book, David, arrange for Krugman to denounce your book. <laughs> because it immediately uh, causes sales to soar. Now, if you, some of you have my book, you can see it's 700 pages of real heavy duty financial and economic monetary history going all the way back to 1914 when the Fed opened its doors. It's full of wonky stuff, but analyzing public policy, and it's number four on the Amazon list, and I'm not bragging, but that happened overnight once it got denounced by Krugman. And I noticed then, I wasn't paying any attention to Amazon, I was just trying to tell the story of my book, and I noticed there's only three books uh, in front of me. Two of them are diet books, and one of them is called The Walking Dead. <laughs> and so, um, I uh, conclude, you know, I, I would like to say my book is about a diet, a massive diet we need in this nation, both fiscally and in terms of the scope and scale and purposes of government, but even more so in terms of getting this rogue, out of control central bank back into some kind of box where it is not a clear and present danger. Uh, to the United States. Now, I know we can talk about uh, many uh, features of that, but what I'd like to do now is suggest that even though there's 700 pages here and there's a lot of history, that really there are three big ideas in this book that I think are pretty much along the libertarian mainstream. I have been a deviant every now and then on certain issues. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I was called uh, a serial apostate the other day by uh, some writer. So I never stay always straight and on the straight and narrow. But there are three fundamental ideas, and one of the things I'm trying to do in this book is take these ideas, fiscal rectitude, sound money, we hear that, we know, we have a feel for what those mean, free markets, and trace them through the ebb and flow of history and events and policy decisions and uh, you know, financial uh, world uh, evolution over decades and decades to try to identify those inflection points, those critical time, times when choices were made that led in the wrong direction. Because obviously today, the free market is almost dead. Today, the fiscal uh, equation amounts to a doomsday machine. I don't know how it's going to be stopped or how the national debt doesn't keep growing uh, towards 30 trillion, 115 percent of GDP, and I could go into some of those things as well. So we have, what I've tried to do in the book then is to say, how did free markets get abolished? And they did for the most part. Or why the heck did we bail out Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan and AIG, Morgan Stanley, AIG, the auto uh, companies, and so forth? And that was done by a Republican administration. So I'm not trying to be a doom and gloom guy, but if a Republican administration does this kind of abomination, then there isn't a lot left in terms of resilience, residence, I guess I should say, for free market policy uh, in uh, the governing process. So if sound money clearly is out the window, and everybody knows that, but let me give you one number that has really been striking to me. And that is on September 10, uh, 2008, uh, before the Lehman Brothers uh, uh, collapse occurred and then all the madness happened after that, the balance sheet of the Fed was 900 billion 
and it had taken the grand total of 94 years to build from zero when they opened the doors to 94 billion. And that's important, or 90 billion, because, 900 billion, I'm sorry, 94 years, and that's important because remember, the balance sheet of the Fed on one side has assets, mostly government debt, bills, bonds, and so forth. On the other side has the liabilities that the Fed has created. In other words, in shorthand, the money that is uh, printed uh, over uh, many, many, many years. Now, if it took them 94 years to print the first 900 billion, and during that period we had some great Fed chairman like William Chesney Martin, he's one of the heroes that I have in my book, some spectacular Fed chairman like Volcker, I really think he was great, and we had some real disasters like uh, Arthur Burns and uh, both uh, Greenspan and Bernanke. So, but still, if it took us 94 years to get there through good and bad policy, listen to this one. In the next seven weeks, Bernanke doubled that 900 billion to 1.8 trillion. He was printing money at the rate of 700 million an hour. No joking, those are the facts. You can see it on the Fed balance sheet that's uh, issued every Thursday afternoon. Now, they've got all kinds of excuses and Wall Street is melting down, we can get into that lately. No, the bubble they had created in the first four or five years was being deflated. The debt that was being liquidated was bad debt. It never should have been there in the first place. So this was a healthy thing going on. And yet, here we are today, and this is why I think the idea of selling money is so lost, a healthy thing is happening, a purge is going on, and yet we have a panic at the Fed that basically ended up propping up all the assets that were way overvalued as the uh, repo debt and commercial paper market debt and unsecured debt was liquidated. The Fed came in right behind it and recreated uh, uh, the funding for this whole house of cards. Now that is about the worst performance that any central bank could make, and it's led to all kinds of bad things. We could talk about the speculation and so forth. So, if we are today in a world where we have utterly unsound money, where we have a rogue bank that has basically destroyed the financial markets, remember, I think all of you would agree, the interest rate is the price in financial markets. In the money market, the overnight rate is the price of money. Uh, in the mid and longer term debt markets, the yield or the interest rate is the price of money. If we don't have a pricing mechanism and something is fluid and dynamic and giant and changing by the hour and minute as the financial system, which is the heart of capitalism, then how is the thing going to function? Well, we don't. We don't have honest interest rates. We have a Fed that pegs them, that sets them, that administers them. And as a result, the whole market has become perverted, and it now trades on what the Fed is going to do next week, ne next month, on whatever smoke signal some highly paid so-called money market economists can figure out You know what the last three swing members of, of the open market committee uh, may uh, decide to do. And therefore, the market is not discounting the future. It's not discounting risk. It's not discounting the contracts and any particular security uh, that's being valued. It's not discounting cash flow. It's discounting the Politburo, the Monetary Politburo of 12 people, and which side of bed they wake up in the morning, and what kind of intellectual tick uh, they have uh, this day or that. So it's all <laughs> in bad shape the fundamental things that we believe in, fiscal records and sound money, free markets. The book is how it, about how it happened, the flow of history over time. And in order to make it, and I wouldn't, I make it more vivid, make it more real, because you can't rewrite, you know, 80 years of history, uh, even in 700 pages, believe me. So I have basically tried to pinpoint critical inflection points and some of the great actors who came across the stage, and I've divided them into 18 policy heroes and 18 policy villains, not because I think they were good or bad people, but at these important junctures they made good or bad decisions. They led to the decline, to the undermining, uh, erosion of these three core ideas, uh, or they helped uh, keep them alive. Now, let's take fiscal rectitude 
And here is where we get to, from the abstract to the concrete, and the debate that has gone on in the conservative community. I've been involved in budget fights, or I was for a long time. And I come out on the side of you have to balance the budget, even if you think the spending is too high, after you've given a good, sustained college try at, sh at uh, uh, starving the beast or shrinking the budget. So we have this fundamental debate that I'd like to talk about in history for a second on um, this idea. What is the right uh, strategic route? Starve the beast, we've heard a lot about, or pay the bills. And I come, out, uh, I come out on the side of pay the bills. The thing that came out of the Reagan era, which really was a horrible legacy, was the notion that deficits didn't matter and the rationalization that we were only trying to starve the beast and if the deficit got big enough or persistent enough or uh, extended far enough in time, surely uh, they would wake up and shrink the government. Well, it's at 24% of GDP today, 25. Uh, by some counts, it was 22 when I got there way back in 1981. So uh, starving the beast hasn't worked. It has only led to a two-party competition in free lunches, the Republicans being the party of stimulating the economy, and frankly, that status, micromanaging the economy through the IRS code, uh, they became what I would call, what I call the uh, Keynesians of the prosperous classes, versus the Democrats uh, using traditional Keynesian spending and uh, you know, liberal uh, interventionist approaches. So when you have two free lunch parties competing for the electorate, you end up with massive, consistent, growing, and ultimately uh, incurable national debt, and that's where we are. Now, my hero in this is Eisenhower, and my villain is Gingrich. Eisenhower basically said, when he took office, the wartime rates of imperative tax rates from Truman are way too high. They are hurting the economy. He hired a treasury secretary, who's another one of the quote, heroes in my book, George Humphreys, who was a, stir, a sternly, stoutly anti-tax industrialist from Cleveland. He ran Cleveland Cliffs, or one of those. And both of them together agreed we are not entitled to do the easy work of cutting taxes and getting rid of these very high rates that were left over from World War II and the Freedom War until we've earned the right to do it by balancing the budget. And so they went in hammer and tong after the Defense Department initially, and they were able in three years to demobilize the vast defense establishment that we had from the Korean War. And in today's dollars, to make it re real to all of you, today's depreciated dollar. The defense budget that Truman left in was $515 billion, today's purchasing. And by the time I got done, three years later, it was $370 billion. In other words, the greatest war hero, the only great general we ever had in the White House in this century, knew that a quarter, a half trillion dollar defense, uh, defense budget, even against the Soviet Union in those days when the Soviet Union had a little industrial bigger left, was not necessary. He unstintingly cut it, and not just by nickel and diamond. He changed the whole strategy, uh, cut the uh, military force by a million men, dramatically reduced uh, the land forces so we couldn't go around <coughs> invading and occupying everyone, and relied on massive public retaliation, which I think was the right strategy. But the point is, after he got that finally done and made major cuts in other parts of the domestic budget, he got a balanced budget in 1955 and then began to chip away at the tax code as well. And during his administration, we had the only period of consistent balanced budgets. We had a recession that really was the leftover from the overheating of, war, of the Korean War and then uh, a sharp, a short one in 1958. But the point is, Eisenhower demonstrated the way that I think the only way that democracy can function fiscally, and that is do the hard work first, cut the spending, then when you earn the right to cut the taxes, do it, and if you do it that way, the people will see the cost of big government. If the people are told by Krugman, don't worry about the debt because you know, it's only 80% uh, of GDP, which is a lie, 
uh, then they will uh, not demand spending cuts. They will not demand hard choices. They will not understand why they're being proposed if they are. And so that is uh, one of the things that um, you know is a big theme in my book. And I call Eisenhower the anti beatrich because Beatrich and I had a huge fight in the early 80s when he accused me of wanting to be, after I realized we had to raise taxes because we cut them too much the first time, in which he accused me of wanting to be the tax collector for the welfare state. Well, I finally figured it out after all these years of smarting under that um, uh, epithet that actually Eisenhower was the tax collector for the welfare state. He showed that it had to be done if he couldn't cut tax uh, spending anymore. And that Reagan ended up being the tax collector for the welfare state as well, wouldn't admit it. There is no shame in it as long as you keep trying to cut the welfare state and reminding people that their taxes are where they are today, including 15% payroll tax, employer and employee on the big social insurance programs, and that those are unnecessary if we could shrink them, but until we can shrink Social Security, let's say, and uh, means tested and get rid of this terrible FDR idea of social insurance for everybody, uh, you're going to have to pay those taxes. Now, the problem, and then I'll move to my next point quickly, the problem is after you go long enough under the starve the beast theory, under two-party free lunch competition, the deficit structurally becomes so big and grain and persistent, and the debt begins to grow to such enormous magnitude as it is today, that then it becomes, you pass the tipping point, and it becomes a doomsday machine. <laughs> which is something that can't be stopped. And I'm afraid we're at that point. I see no way that we're not going to be at the, in the rosy scenarios that are using to forecast the budget today are way too optimistic if you do a realistic estimate of where we are with current policy after the, the so-called New Year's uh, compromise. We're looking at 15 to 20 trillion new debt in the next 10 years, not seven. Sound money. Here is where I have a big uh, a demarcation line in my book between Milton Friedman's folly and Carter Glass's wisdom. And Carter, I'm not talking about Glass-Steagall, I'm talking about Carter Glass, chairman of the House Banking Committee, founder of the Fed, who envisioned the Fed as a banker's bank that on a passive basis ran a discount window where real live commercial banks uh, Main Street banks, as he called them, the banks of industry and commerce, could bring their good collateral, let's say inventory loans or receivables uh, that had uh, already been produced and shipped but not uh, matured, could bring them to the discount window and borrow money at a penalty rate above the free market interest rate that the Fed was supposed to have nothing to do with. Now, the model of the banker's bank that was behind uh, the original conception and Carter Glass's idea uh, had two features which are unbelievably novel today. One is that the Fed, in its first uh, statute, was not allowed to buy government debt. It was only allowed to liquefy real commercial paper that represented economic activity coming out of the private enterprise system as a result of the to and fro of commerce and not because of what someone sitting on a board in Washington thought uh, was necessary in terms of bank reserves and so forth. Now, if that idea of a passive banker's bank is the opposite of the open market committee to be in the debt markets day in and day out, buying debt, buying debt, to peg interest rates because they're trying to manage the whole financial system and the whole GDP. As Bernanke said, we're going to get the unemployment rate to 6.5% or some damn thing, and you can't even measure it. Now that's central planning. That's the opposite principle. That is the central bank actively intervening in the market to say, this is how much liquidity we think ought to be in the economy, this is what the rate of debt creation ought to be, these are the interest rates that in our wisdom we decide will bring about all these wondrous things. Now I call that monetary central planning, I call that 
the Monetary Politburo because there are 12 people deciding uh, you know, what the uh, liquidity of the financial markets ought to be in the financial system. It's the opposite of the Carter Glass notion and the, the Carter Glass notion, even though uh, a lot of people identify him only with Glass Eagle, which I actually support as well, but the Carter Glass notion was that there is no target GDP. It was not like Professor Krugman or even Art Lapper who says, you know, the GDP ought to grow 4%, uh, and if it isn't, then you ought to do this, that, and the other thing to make it happen in Washington. Uh, the idea that came out of the original uh, glass uh, banking, uh, central bank, was that GDP will be whatever it is. If it grows at 2%, fine. 4% fine if it goes through a period where it's only growing, you know, half a percent or negative, that's okay too. That's the result of the interaction of producers, consumers, investors, real people in the free market. And therefore, the free market is incompatible with central bank monetary planning, and the kind of Fed that came out of Friedman's idea, and I know he, uh, you know, his defenders uh, will find this, uh, you know, uh, very uh, much, uh, they'll contest this very much, but it is the opposite because it said a board of 12 people could decide how much M1 we need, and therefore, knowing how much M1 we need, they would know how much credit would be created by the banking system, and if the banking system created the right amount of credit, uh, the economy would grow at the right rate. Actually, Milton Friedman was a central planner, and he didn't know it, and he was naive politically, because how could he have believed, which he did, that if we give 12 members of a Politburo after we've severed the Bretton Woods and the gold standard and any linkage of what the central bank does to a redeemable asset, once you give that power to the 12 members of the uh, of Open Market Committee, you end up with a Politburo. Now here's the dilemma. Friedman was a very naive man. He was an idealistic man, but somehow he appears to have believed that 12 monetary eunuchs could get appointed to the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, and they would sit around most of the day reading book reviews and playing Scrabble or something, and occasionally uh, change the dials a little bit to keep the money supply growth at 3%. Well, that wasn't going to happen, and you saw that immediately when they closed the gold window and they turned great Professor Arthur Burns loose to print all the money that Nixon wanted in order to get the economy booming by July 1972, which I have it all in my book. That's exactly what the White House taped system shows that he told um, uh, Ehrlichman uh, er and Haldeman he wanted done uh, well before Camp David and all that mess. So unfortunately, uh, Friedman's idea got used by a statist nationalistic politician for his own short-term electoral needs. He brought all of the free market economists of the era out to Camp David, and as you remember, they came up with the NEP. And uh, that was, uh, even at the time, I was only a young man in Washington, I don't know if Dave was there yet, but even then I um, almost bent over laughing because I knew the NEP stood for the New Economic uh, Program Plan that Lenin put into place in 1921 in order to bail out his huge experiment in collectivism and communism, which was failing. But anyway, that was the line of demarcation the book goes into a whole chapter on Friedman's folly and how it, it led to not his monetary eunuchs, but the people like Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke and this Rosengren guy uh, up at uh, uh, the Boston uh, today, uh, Federal Reserve of Boston, who last week uh, gave a speech in which he said, yes, we are trying to force people out of savings accounts that only pay uh, half a percent, because we want them into risk assets. In other words, he's saying, we want Granny to go out and buy some junk bonds because we, the Monetary Policy Bureau, decided that that is better for the economy. And if Granny wants to have something more to eat off the savings that her husband, late husband, left her than dog food, she's got to buy, uh, she's got to buy high yield bonds, junk bonds. This is a terrible, terrible abuse of democracy. 
of all the monetary sins and economic errors and so forth that I could talk about in the unsound money of the Fed today. The worst thing is, it is utterly undemocratic. They today bailed out the banks over the last four years by driving the deposit rates down near zero. And as a result, banks have been able to generate the spread between almost no cost of deposits and whatever they're getting in uh, yields on their securities and on their loans. They've taken that artificial spread, totally created by the Fed, used it uh, to uh, repair their balance sheets, and now say, look at here, we're healthy, uh, we paid back the tarp, uh, and now let us do some more stock buybacks and let us go out and pay some big dividends when in fact it has all come out of the hide of savers in America. Now if you put that proposition that can we tax the savers of America by four or five hundred billion, which is what it amounts to if you do the math, each year so that we can take it out of their savings accounts and put it in the balance sheet retained earnings of the commercial banks, how many votes do you think it would get? I don't have to answer that rhetorical question. It would get no, no votes. So the Fed is doing things today, driving people into risks they don't want to have, crushing the savers of America, inflating bubbles time after time. This is the third time, by the way, we've been in the vicinity of 1560. We were back there, you know how long ago? 4,750 days ago is the last time we were at the same level that the market's at today. And we've had uh, two huge collapses in between that did everlasting damage. So that is the whole issue of uh, sound money. There's a lot of steps along the way. I reach back to the FDR because I really think when he confiscated the gold in 1933, that was the beginning of the slide uh, that eventually <coughs> led to Camp David, that it led to Greenspan, that led to the long-term capital bailout in 1998, led to the panic in 201, the housing bubble, uh, the awful bailouts of the banks and so forth after that. Now, the, the third thing is free markets, and my point is um, bad money pollutes free markets. And therefore, we don't have, uh, we can't say today that if some outcome occurs uh, in the financial markets, that that is an honest result of the interaction of supply and demand. As I said, all the markets are simply trading the Fed, front-running the Fed, buying anything that they think is going to be propped up, supported, uh, or liquefied by the Fed. It's totally distorting behavior. And as a result of that, it leads to massive gambling and to leverage and to uh, rent-seeking behavior that has nothing to do with economic growth, wealth creation, and productivity, but gives capitalism a bad name, gives free markets a bad name. And the problem is a lot of free market people, in my judgment, misunderstand the application of the free market principle to Wall Street. Wall Street is not a market. Wall Street is a branch office of the Federal Reserve. And so therefore, you can't judge what's going on there under uh, some kind of notion that uh, it happened in the market, and so therefore, um, the outcome is OK. Now that's why I think the bailouts in, in 2008 were so insidious. They, and I say in my book, we had a coup d'etat, effectively, an economic coup d'etat, by Goldman and the other bankers who occupied the third floor of the Treasury, and finally, by September 2008, the rot on the balance sheets of these big investment banks, which were really uh, hedge funds in drag, really in disguise, um, was so bad that they toppled under their own weight. And finally, Mr. Market was raising his hand saying, let me bring this nonsense to a halt. Let me liquidate these, you know, this house of cards, this layer upon layer of creating asset, bid up the price, borrow money against it, buy some more of the same assets, drive them higher, use that as collateral, it's called hypothecation, rehypothecation, rehypothecation. It is the same thing as fractional reserve banking, and some of you students of that know the problem once uh, you get the string going. 
So we should have let it all go down. I have a whole section in my book on the Blackberry Panic and how AIG was not a contagious economic disease that was going to spread around the world. It could have gone under. All the bad paper, the so-called CDS, was written at the holding company. They could have bankrupted the holding company. All of the insurance companies were in subsidiaries, regulated by state insurance commissions. They had dividend stoppers and capital standards in place. They couldn't have got the assets out. They couldn't have got the cash out. They wouldn't have used it to uh, pay off the CDS and create uh, further runs in the market. In short, what was going on was a run in the wholesale money market, the overnight money market in the canyons of Wall Street. And it would have burned out in the canyons of Wall Street. And it would have taken Goldman down, so be it. It would have taken Morgan Stanley down, so be it. The other three were already gone. Morgan's Merrill Lynch was being carried out in a slab to Bank of America where the experience was gone and Lehman was. It wouldn't have hurt anything because the, there was a lot of talent and capability in those three companies. The speculators and gamblers in those three companies would have lost their equity entirely. They would have lost a lot of reputation. And so, some of them would have reorganized afterwards, hung out a shingle, calling it Golden M&A II and it would have been a lot more cautious place than the one that was bailed out uh, with all of this uh, uh, federal Fed intervention and uh, TARP money. So the, uh, one of the interesting stories I tell in the book is to compare the Blackberry Panic of 2008 with the Panic of 1907 before the Fed. And in 1907, when they had the Great Panic, it was resolved in J.P. Morgan Library, which still exists on uh, Madison Avenue in New York today. But J.P. Morgan was using his own money and the money of his syndicates of bankers, including the clearinghouse banks of New York. And night after night, the, the supplicants came in. They brought their collateral, their balance sheet, sheets. J.P. Morgan's young man looked at them and said, you're insolvent, goodbye, <laughs> uh, meet your maker. And others, they said, you're solvent because you've made some <coughs> horrendous mistakes here. You're gone. We're going to give a loan to your bank, but we're bringing the new officers tomorrow morning. Fired all the officers, fired all the boards, resuscitated the solvent banks. And why did they do it that way? Because it was their money at risk, and they weren't going to create moral hazard in the future. Now, when you have the Fed with the printing press, or you have TARP with the taxpayers' money, they don't care. And what happened? Not one guy was fired, that I can tell, in any of these banks that were rescued. Not one board was told, uh, take a hike, you screwed up, you didn't uh, uh, you know, do your discharge your duties running this bank. So anyway, that led uh, to um, some very serious um, you know, assaults uh, on the free market. And again, uh, it's one of the reasons why we're in such difficult uh, uh, trouble today. Well, these are the three get great ideas that go through the book. There are people on both sides, and some will say, why in the hell do you have Bill Clinton in the hero category? I'll admit that. Because he balanced the budget three times, and I know a lot of people won't like that because he balanced it at a high level, but it needs to be balanced. We can't live with permanent debt. We're going to ruin uh, the country. We're going to ruin the future generations. So that's uh, kind of a little, that's chapter one. And <laughs> the rest of you, uh, we'll look at the book and we can talk about uh, some more and answer some questions. Thank you. All right.